Okay. Thanks for coming, everybody. I love that one. No, you feel like you can just go after that. <laughs> you can just go out and, as Doug says, bite the bumper hitch off a truck. I've tried it. It doesn't work. But I felt like I could. You know, I so appreciate uh, quite a few things in this place. I appreciate our pastors. Appreciate our congregation. Appreciate the work that's done behind the scenes because the cameras are pointed up here. I wish we had a camera that was pointed back there so that you could see the work that goes on just to bring this to you at home. The patience and the dedication and the coming early and the working late. You know, Pastor Taffy was, was speaking and she talked about your position compared to your situation. And immediately Paul's words came forth in my head. And you know, he says in one of his letters that I pray blessings upon you in this life and in the one to come. Amen? We think the blessings are in the kingdom of heaven, which they are forever and ever and ever and ever. But do you think God wants us to live sad, broke, busted, and disgusted down here on this earth? I don't think so. I think there will be those times because, you know, we've got arch enemies. We've got things in the pit of this earth that are trying to defeat us every single day. And it's you that they're after. Thank God that the blood of Christ covers that and there's more power in God's little pinky than there is in the entire legion that fell from the kingdom of heaven, amen? They're punks, they're useless, they're worthless. The problem is they don't know that. They just wanna see us knocked off our position in life and they wanna try and knock God off the throne as if that was possible because God's always been on his throne. He's on his throne now, and he always will be on his throne from everlasting to everlasting. You wanna blow your mind? Just think about this. Eternity is forever. It's, listen, we are, we are carbon particles, and our minds are very limited. I do a Bible study, as you know. It's called Wednesdays with Pastor Steve. If you at home want to join, it's Pastor underscore Steve 777. It's at 7 p.m. First half of it is just encouragement, speaking my heart. And the second half is Bible study, which we are in the book of 1 Peter right now. But I got to talking. You should go back and watch just this last one. I, I, I got a lot of people all messed up because I was talking about the kingdom of heaven being forever and ever and ever and ever. And what we'll do is we'll worship God. That's what we'll do. There's no dirt bike riding. There's no yachting, unfortunately for me. No ocean, where would I put my yacht? There's not golf that I know of. It doesn't mention it anyway. There might be. It's just Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit and us in changed bodies so that we can understand forever. People, my mom and dad were like, I, I don't forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I don't understand. I said, well, if it does any good, I don't understand either. But I try to think about it because it makes me really, really happy to know that the pains and the struggles of this life just for a little time, Paul says, like a vapor that comes off a steaming pot and then just vanishes as it goes up. That's all we've got to put up with. Bob and Connie Rose <laughs> called me and said, you know, we were laying in bed and we were talking last night about heaven and forever. And you see, they come from 58 years of being Jehovah's Witnesses before they got saved right here on this platform. And they were told that there is no such thing. There is, but you're not going. How would you like to be told that? Heaven's full already. The 144,000 are done. They're finished. We know who they are. So the rest of you get to stay around the outside. It, you know, it won't, be a, it won't be bad, but it won't be heaven. God says, all that will come shall come. Amen. My death is for everybody at any time, all the time, and whoever will come. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes shall have eternal life. 
All right, so we've all thought about that, right? We've all thought, I can't, Pastor, I can't comprehend always and forever. Always and forever. Different song. Here's the thing that you got to think about. He has been around forever. In ages past, he's always been. <laughs> As if future God was not hard enough to understand. He's always been. And you know why? Because we live in time and we live in space. And when these bodies are changed like Jesus was when it came up out of the grave, and though he had a giant spear hole in his side and all the blood had poured out from his heart, and he had holes in his hands and holes in his things, f- hands and feet that his disciples put their finger into, he still walked and he still talked and he still ate and he still fellowshiped. That tells me that it's not only possible, not only probable, but it's the truth. And if you understand the truth, the truth shall set you free. And those who are free shall be free indeed. I just wanted to bring that encouragement to you. It has nothing to do with my sermon. But this is what I got. This is what I got while I was sitting down there listening to this amazing couple talk about the Lord. I want to do something that's going to embarrass, not me, because... I'm almost unembarrassable anymore. I I would like my good friend Kaylee to come up here with me. I was standing there watching Kaylee and the Lord just put, he just put this giant white aura around her. You ever seen that? This giant white aura hand. Like you like me, hold my hand. Come over here. She's like, oh, boys. Kaylee, I got you up here because the Lord wants to bless you. He wants to put a blessing on your life because he knows your heart. And it's going to be amazing. So stretch out your hands here, folks. This is an amazing girl. She came to us a child, and she has grown up into a woman on this stage where she was hiding in the back, and now she's standing up front playing her heart out. Glory to God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for Kaylee. And we ask that you would do what it is that you put my heart to see, that you would bless her exceedingly abundantly above all that she could ever ask or think. Father, I thank you that her future is so bright she's got to wear shades, that people are going to flock to her to come to Jesus, and she's going to be so blown away by what's going on in her life that she won't believe it herself. Father, I know this woman's heart as we all do, and I know that she has a presence of mind to love you and to need you, and she wants to make disciples for you. God, you need people like that in this generation, and so we pray that you would not only raise up Kaylee to do this impressive job, that you would speak through her when she opens her mouth, and that she would not be afraid. She would be bold in her faith, Lord God, and that you would set disciples before her that would go out and make disciples after them. Father, we thank you for her, for all she is and all she will be, Lord, in your eyes, in your future. In Jesus' name, we thank you for her. Amen and amen. And you can go sit down and not be embarrassed anymore. I know she doesn't like that stuff. But listen, when the Lord calls, you've got to do what the Lord calls you to do. Amen? Because you don't want to miss the blessing. How many times have you tried to give somebody something? You're like, no, 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 I... I don't want to do it. What they don't understand is they're stopping the blessing of you giving. You know, it's a humble thing to go, no, you don't. I don't want to accept anything from you. It's okay. I did it because I love you. Yeah, and I'm doing this because I love you. So don't take that from me, right? So I had to do what I had to do. Listen, let's get underway. <laughs> let's get underway. I, I, I hope I haven't brought this to you before. I think it's hysterical. I want to read it to you. Of course, I think everything's hysterical, so. It says, four brothers left home for college and they became successful doctors and lawyers. One evening they chatted after having dinner together. They discussed the 95th birthday gifts they were able to give their elderly mother who moved to Florida. The first one said, you know, I had a big house built for mama. The second said, and I had a large theater built in that house. And the third said, and I had a, my Mercedes dealer deliver an SL600 to her. The fourth said, you know, Mama loved reading the Bible, and you know she can't read anymore because she can't see very well. I met this preacher who told me about this parrot who could recite the entire Bible. 
took 10 preachers almost eight years to teach them. I had to pledge to contribute $50,000 a year for five years to the church, but it was worth it. Mama only has to name the chapter and the verse and the parrot will recite it. The other brothers were impressed. After the celebration, Mama sent out thank you notes. She wrote Milton, the house you built me is so huge that I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Thanks anyway. Marvin, I'm too old to travel. I stay home. I have my groceries delivered, so I never use the Mercedes. The thought was good. Thanks. Michael, you gave me an expensive theater with Dolby surround sound, and it can hold 50 people. But all my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing, and I'm nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thank you for the gesture, just the same. Dearest Melvin, you were the only son to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift. The chicken was delicious. Thank you so much. Love, Mama. <laughs> you know, I've read that a thousand times and it's still funny. <laughs> I can just see that happening. Last week we had this um, wonderful, beautiful saint named Miss Marva come up here. Remember that when she came up to testify? She had got a hold of me a few weeks back and she said, you know what, I want to I wanna give the testimony of what God has done for me. And I said, sure, what, what, what has he done for you? She said, well, you called me up and prayed for me last year. I said, oh, that's right. You know me. I can't remember if I had breakfast. I said, that's right. She says, and I'm still healed and I want to testify. So she got the courage and the strength. I talked to the pastor. He said, absolutely, for sure, bring her up. And so we brought her up here. She testified of when the Lord spoke through me and said that there was somebody in the audience who had a bad knee. And if they would come up, they would be healed. She came up. We prayed for her. She got well, and she never not got well. 2012, my mother went to the hospital with 70% blocked carotid artery. That was a Sunday, early Sunday morning, late Sunday night. They gave her the paperwork. It showed it on the scans. She was to have surgery that following Friday. She was to go into her doctor Tuesday. I went to her house that morning to pray with her through a long sequence of events. Three days later, we prayed for her, laid hands on her. She felt this tingly heat, went to the doctor. The doctor said, I don't know what you're doing here. There's nothing wrong with you. And she today is still healed. The thing that I told both of those two, both of those two, both of y'all, I don't know, those two people that I prayed for and watched them get well, is I said, here's one thing I've learned. I've been praying for people for a long time, since 2009, and I said, some can keep their healing and some can't. And I'm not exactly 100% sure why that is, but I found something to be true. People who are thankful and who are grateful for that gift from God, they tend to prosper continuously with that removal of that thing. People who go back to their old ways and their old doubts and their old curmudgeonly attitude tend to lose that healing. Now, that's not always the case, but I tell these people today, when I watched them get well, I said, listen, do me a favor. Wake up every day and say, God, I thank you for my healing, and I thank you for who you are in my life. I said, say it all the time, out loud, when you're walking through Walmart, God, I thank you for my healing, and I thank you that it's not going away. Because being thankful is powerful. Being grateful is powerful. You know what I'm thankful and grateful for? Take a guess. Nobody? I'm thankful for this book, amen? I know you are too. You wouldn't be here. This book is the most amazing book that's ever been written in all of history, that ever will be written. When the Egyptian Alexandrian library burned down thousands of years ago and all of the, at that time, modern books went with it, why we don't have a lot of history, this Bible stayed. It can't be burned up. It can't be torn up. It can't be thrown away in enough numbers to make a difference, to make a dent. That Bible is an amazing, amazing thing. Why? Because everything I need to know about life, love, and God are right here in this book. 
It's an amazing book. I want to read you just a few facts. You know, there's a billion interesting facts about the Bible. But I want to read you a few interesting facts about what this Bible is, is made up of. As you know, there are 66 books in the Bible. The Old Testament has 39, and the New Testament has 27. The longest book in the Bible is Psalms, which also has the longest chapter, Psalm 119, while the shortest is 2 John. Psalm 119 is five pages full. 2 John is less than a half a page. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible, 929 in the Old and 260 in the New. The middle chapter of the Bible is Psalm 117, which is also the shortest chapter in the Bible. There are 23,214 verses in the Old Testament, 7,959 in the New Testament, bringing the total to 31,173. I haven't memorized that many. Some, but not 31,000. Sunday schoolers know the shortest verse in the Bible. It's John 11.35, which says, Jesus wept. The longest? Nobody knows that. I didn't know it. Esther 8.9. The book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 9. There are 773,692 words in the Bible and all of them inspired by God himself. The Old Testament has 592, 439. The New Testament has 181, 253. The Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years by 40 different people. The oldest book is dated to about 1,400 B.C. 1,400 B.C., there's some... If I'm not mistaken, there's some 4,000 years of biblical history back to Noah. But yet the Bible had only been written 2,500 years after it all started. The books of the Bible were originally just that. They were books. They were separate. Modern chapter divisions were completed around AD 1227 by Stephen Langton. Old Testament verse numbers were made by a Jewish rabbi named Nathan in 1448, and the New Testament verse numbers were developed by Robert Estienne, also called Stephanus, in 1551. So from 1227 to 1551 is when we got chapter and verse that we have today. More than 3,000 times the Bible refers to the words spoken by God himself. And every day in the United States, more than 168,000 Bibles are either sold or given away. Every day, 168,000 Bibles are put into somebody's hands. That's good news. Lest you thought that we were losing, that life was so bad that we couldn't get the word of God out anymore. Yes, church population is declining. Yes, salvation numbers are declining. But the word of God stands forever. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of God will stand forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So why is it that I tell people to be thankful and grateful? Why is being thankful and grateful so important? Well, I don't know about you, but I'd rather do something for someone who is thankful and who is grateful than a crabby complainer, wouldn't you? You ever had that happen? This is the woman, right? You give her a big house. She can't use it, she lives in one room, but she's gotta clean the whole thing. But that theater in there, she's deaf, she's blind, all her friends are dead, but thanks anyway. You get it? You do good things for people that just go, meh. But when you do good things for people and they are so thankful and they are so grateful, You know, Pastor, Bob and Connie were so thankful and so grateful for their salvation. They were buying Virginia and I gifts. I had to stop them. I said, I said, enough, stop. It was given to me freely and I gave it to you freely. I appreciate it more than you'll know. To see see that thankfulness coming from somebody is absolutely amazing because that's when you know people are sold on who Jesus is and what Holy Spirit has done in their life. 
that's, that's the people that you, that you really enjoy doing for. Uh, listen, I'll do for the crowd a complainer when God tells me to do, but I really enjoy doing for the person who really appreciates what you did. When you put your heart and your mind, don't you think God feels the same way about us? It does, <laughs> as pastor says, <laughs> God loves the cheerful giver, but he'll take it from a crab. He'll take it from a grump. And we say that jokingly. But the Bible does say that God loves a cheerful giver. This is my point exactly. He loves thankful people. He loves grateful people. He loves people that understand that it is my honor to give. And it's one that I don't want to stop. Here's an English 101 pop quiz. What do we call someone who is ungrateful? Louder and ingrate. I don't know why we call them that, but that's the definition. An ingrate is someone who is not grateful. And I haven't used that word in a long time, but I've used it in my life before. Yeah, they're such an ingrate. People who think they just deserve everything, that don't ever say thank you, that don't, you know, I hold a door. I'm bad this way. I hold a door open for somebody, and it's not just women. I hold it open for everybody. And they walk right past, don't even know I'm there. That's all right. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I, I probably shouldn't. You would know, be humbler if I just opened the door and didn't say anything. <laughs> what an ingrate. And I don't know. Maybe they're just not comfortable with people. Maybe they don't normally have people do that. I look at it like they think, well, what, I can't open my own door? Well, you can, but I got to it first. Personally, I don't think God appreciates ingrates, do you? I, I don't think that when he gives his son in a brutal, brutal death on that cross and the beating that he took prior to, so weak that he couldn't carry a 100-pound cross up the street called Straight to Golgotha. And they reject him, outrightly reject him. Now that's an ingrate. I am so grateful as I know you are, so thankful for God's love and for his mercy and for his grace and his compassion and his kindness and his long suffering because I need it more than most. You didn't hear it, but everybody just said amen in here. That's, that's not right. I, I need it more than most. Listen, this, the passion that I have also comes with the dark side. And I, it just, you know, my wife is, is not here today because she's going out to help our daughter-in-law while my son is in Florida training for a new position in Target. And she's going to be with that baby. And uh, I'm a little jealous. Is that okay? Is that okay if I'm a little jealous? But I'm thankful to be here with you. I'm thankful to be able to preach the gospel. When, when our son first asked her to come, I was like, the old me years and years ago would have insisted that I go too. Anybody like that? Anybody know anybody like that? If you're going, I'm going. You're not going without me. I, why do you get to go? I raised him too. I want to see the ground. <laughs> Might not mean much to you. But for me to look in the mirror and see this guy that sent my wife off with a blessing this morning, that's amazing to me because I know me. We have a dog door that fits in the sliding glass door. I, I picked it up off the street years ago. Had no dog, but I can't see good stuff go to waste. You know, you got things you just don't use anymore, but they're perfectly good, and you just stick it out in the trash. I picked it up. Well, so it worked. Put it in the, put it in the uh, sliding glass door. Our sliding glass door now is barely wide enough for me to get my fat Jesus body through. So I want to put it in the wall. There's a perfect spot for it. My wife wanted it over here. I said, if I do that, I've got to put a hole in the outside of the stucco with the hole for this, and I've got to move that electrical out there so I can jump it and bring it back in so that I can make that longer because there's not room for it, and I've got to cut through a stud. I'm explaining and explaining and explaining why we shouldn't do it that way. What do you think the answer was? So we're going to do it that way? No! So we were <laughs> all night long, and I thought, my God. Steve, have you learned nothing in your lifetime? Your wife is going to see your son and your daughter-in-law and your first grandbaby. 
and the devil is coming in and he's trying to do anything to make that a problem. It happens every time we're going to do something good in Christ. I don't know about you, but it happens every time to us. And we just bang heads. I got to go back and say, oh, sweetheart, I'm sorry. Wasn't much of a leader. Wasn't much of a compassionate husband. I said, so do you want it where I'm going to put it or not? <laughs> and she said, sure. <laughs> but the devil is out and his demons and his imps and his whatever else he's got going on down there to tear you apart. Don't let him do it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his heavenly face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So thankful, what, what do we, when I say be thankful, you know what I'm saying. But what's the actual definition of thankful? It is being pleased and relieved. Oh, you ever been able to do that? Oh, I'm so thankful. You're pleased with what's happening, what has happened. You're relieved that it has happened. And what's the definition of grateful? It is feeling or showing an appreciation or a kindness. They kind of seem like the same thing. And they are, so what's the difference? The difference between thankful and grateful is one is a feeling and one is an action. Bob and Connie were so thankful that the action they turned that into was gratefulness by giving. It's all they knew how to do. The first appearance of thankfulness, if you've got your Bible, it shows up, or your Bible phones, it shows up in the book of Leviticus, the big book of the law. It shows up in Leviticus chapter 7, verses 11 through 15. Leviticus chapter 7 verses 11 through 15, here's the, here's the order for the priest's part in the offerings that are supposed to be made now. Now this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings which shall be presented to the Lord. If he offers it by way of thanksgiving, then along with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, he shall offer unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened water, wafers spread with oil, and cakes of well-stirred fine flour mixed with oil. Now I'm hungry, and there seems to be a pattern here. Oil's good for you. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall present his offering with cakes of leavened bread. And of this he shall present one of every offering as a contribution to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings. Now, as for the flesh of the sacrifice of his thanksgiving, peace offerings, it shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it over until morning. I should have been a priest because I got that part down. You feed me, I leave none of it over. When I was young, my favorite word was, my favorite line at a dinner table, at a lunch table, at a breakfast table was, William, you gonna finish that? There you go. I ate my mom's, I ate my dad's, I ate my brother's, I ate mine. But you can see, you didn't hear that, and I'm going to tell on him, pastor said, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. I look at the dog, go, Gracie, you going to finish that? Thankfulness is also mentioned some 139 times in the Bible. 139 times in the Bible. You think it's important? You think God wants us to be thankful? You think he wants us to be grateful? 139 times-ish. And aren't all the songs that we sing, we think about this, aren't all the songs that we sing up here or ever have sung or ever will sing about being thankful? and about being grateful, whether it's Southern gospel, old time hymns, new contemporary stuff, solo performance stuff that you go see at a concert. Isn't it about, in Christianity, it's about being thankful and it's about being grateful. Because all the songs we sing are thanking God for what he's done for us by way of Jesus, his son. That's why we sing. 
The book of Psalms, chapter 107, verse 1. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. You know, speaking of all the songs we sing, when I began to study for this this week, the title came immediately. And so that Bob doesn't have to ask me later, I'll tell you what it is now. Give thanks with a grateful heart. And the moment <laughs> that that came on me and I wrote it down, the Spirit of God began to sing inside of me. Guess what he sang? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done singing that song and I can't get it out of my head and I'm so thankful that I can't you know the garbage I used to sing in my head when I was away from the Lord the things I used to think the places I used to go the things I used to do with the stuff I used to watch you got to know for a guy like that who ended up in a place like this that he's thankful and he's grateful to Jesus Christ for giving himself for no greater love has this than a man would lay down his life for a friend. For no longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. Friends, I want to tell you being thankful is very, very important. Being grateful is very, very important. Don't take this wrong, Tiffany. I wish I was married to this guy. Because I love to sing and he loves to play. I don't think that's three lessons. That's self-taught. That's an amazing gift of God. And I know every day that he and his wife and probably now his children are thankful for those talents. Can you imagine being able to sit down and do that? I love you. Why couldn't you spread that gift around a little bit? Why'd you give it all to him? You know, the book of Psalms is an amazing book in itself. I know a lot of you read Psalms and Proverbs as a daily devotion because it's, that's what they are. The Psalms are songs and Proverbs are, are daily what you needs and what you should do's in life. But the book of Psalms is an amazing book. It's in the middle of the Bible. It's the exact middle. 
And in fact, chapter 117, as I read before, is the exact middle of, of, of the whole book itself. It is also miraculously one of the shortest chapters. There's no extra charge for that info, by the way. It's just info. The book of Psalms just, it speaks to me in a lot of ways like no other. Right, there was at least five writers, maybe seven, and there's 50 books we can't even account for. It shows heart and it shows passion, unlike a lot of the other books do. After all of this, is being thankful important? As one of the old time comedians back in the 60s used to say, you bet your sweet bippy. You bet your sweet bippy that thankfulness is important. It is probably one of the most important things a Christian can do in their life. If you are ungrateful and unthankful for the things that God has done for you and have given to you, your future may be pretty bleak as far as what will be given to you and what will be done for you. And I don't say that because God doesn't love you anymore. I don't say that because he, he's just a guy that only wants to get rewarded with praise and honor. But listen, we were created to worship him. And thankfulness and gratefulness is a form of worship that we owe our Lord and Savior. How do we know that being thankful is important? Well, in John chapter 11, in verse 41, Jesus says something that just blows me away to even think about. This is the chapter that everybody knows. There was a, a set of sisters and a brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And the Bible tells us that Jesus really loved these three. We know God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but Jesus really had an affinity for these three. And Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus in Jerusalem from Bethany that Lazarus had fallen sick. And so Jesus told his disciples that Lazarus had fallen asleep and we were going to go raise him. And the apostles being who they were, uh, well, if he's sleeping, he'll, he'll get up by himself. Master, it's okay. They had no idea what he was talking about. So he finally had to look at him and go, uh, he's dead. D dead, are you listening? Dead, he's not sleeping, he's dead. But you're going to witness a miracle. Well, rather than going right over there and healing him, we know that he waited how many days? He waited four full days. And it was so long, in case you're wondering when a body starts decomposing, what's the Bible say about that body? It stinketh in the King James. I don't know if you've ever smelled a mouse that gets in your wall and starts to ooze garbage and, and you can't get it out of there and you've just got to smell through the week. <laughs> that sour, rancid, nasty smell of a carcass that's going bad. This is him. I'm not trying to make you enjoy your lunch. <laughs> I'm not trying to make you sick, but this is what happens because they didn't gut people and all. They just wrapped you up, put all kind of oil and spices on you so that you wouldn't, you know, disgust everybody that walked past you. And they put him in a tomb. And he had been in there four days. And so he went over there. And of course, Mary and Martha, they, they come over and they're falling at his feet. And they're, and they're, oh, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. We know the whole story, Right. And you can preach that story six different ways to Sunday because there's so much packed into that one story and so much to do there. But the one thing, the one thing that blows me away is when Jesus goes to that tomb, he doesn't just go in and yell, Lazarus, come forth. He says in 1141, and so they removed the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast hearest me. Did, did Jesus really need to do? Jesus is God. He's thanking himself in my mind. Does he really need to bow down to his father in heaven when his father has given him all power and authority? Because in our minds, it gets all messed up. Yeah, my point being, if it was important enough for Jesus 
to be thankful, then I'm reckoning it's important enough for us to be thankful because it says that Jesus was tempted in every way. That means he had to be so that we couldn't go, yeah, but you're God, you, you, didn't, you weren't tempted. Of course he was. You go out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights with no food and have the devil all over you and make it through that. Of course he was tempted. And he was tempted with a point and the point was for us so that he could make a way of escape, that we could look to him for our shining example as to how to handle things in life. Father, I thank thee that thou heardest me. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that thou didst send me. The second part of that is, I want you to know that when you've been praying and praying and praying and praying and nothing's happening, are you even listening? I thank you that thou hearest us. Of course he hears us. It's just that his ways are not our ways and our ways are not his ways. They're beyond knowing right now in this present form, in this body. He's got a plan. Was it his plan for my fill in the blank to die? I don't know. But is being mad at him gonna change anything? Be thankful for what you've still got. Be thankful for the circumstances in it. Don't be a crabby complainer. After God had heard him, he yelled, Lazarus, come forth. And I like to do that. <laughs> That's Greek for unwrap this nonsense. Let's get out of here. I'm hungry. I've been on a four-day diet. You think the Daniel fast was bad? That just amazes me. Jesus, who is God, thanks his Father in heaven for hearing him. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, 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 wow. And don't forget, next week it's mom upside down. Thank you. Thank you for that one laugh. <laughs> Did you, you got it, right? Okay, I was just, I could be wrong. I thought I was wrong once, but I was just mistaken, so. <laughs> he was thankful just for hearing him. Not from raising the dead. Not from making the blind to see or all the other things that Jesus was able to do. He was just thankful that the Father was hearing him. I say it over and over and over again. Jesus went away early in the morning, as was his habit, and he prayed. He communed with his Father in heaven. He said, what I hear my Father telling me, I speak to you. Not only did God hear him, but he heard God. I believe we can do the same. Things go so much better when we're thankful. Amen? They go so much better. We're nicer to be around. People appreciate us more. How, how, how many times have you heard people go, I, I, I really like that guy. Why? I just, I don't know, he's just a nice guy. I really like that gal. Why? They're just, I don't know, they seem to be up all the time. They're encouraging. They don't have a bad word to say. Not, not me, that other guy. That's because they're thankful for what there is to be thankful for. You have a choice. Being thankful, being grateful is a choice. Yeah, I know there are bad things and I know damage has happened. I know there are things in people's lives that I can't imagine. Whether you've gone through a really bad divorce or you've lost a child or you're suffering with an illness or whatever it is, we have a choice to either sit and suffer with the thing that is trying to attack us and agree with it and promote it in our own lives? Or we can stand up and, you know, Doug used to tell the story about the donkey that fell in the well. And the guy thought, I can't get that donkey out of that well. He's way too heavy. It's just me. I don't want him to suffer down there days and days and dehydrate. I'll just bury him and suffocate him. So he began to shovel dirt onto that donkey. Makes sense, right? You think that donkey sat there and, and took that? No, he turned what the world was trying to do into it, to him to a stepping stone for his life. 
He shook that dirt off and he stepped up on top of that mound and that farmer threw more dirt on top of him and he shook that dirt off and he stepped up on that mound and wouldn't you know, pretty soon that, that farmer got so tired of showing that dirt, that donkey ended up right at the level where he could walk out of that well. Just be thankful. When life is shoveling dirt on you, just shake it off. Be thankful, be grateful, find something to thank God for. Even if 500 things are going against you and two things are going for you, Focus on those two things. Those aren't going away, so don't worry about thinking about them. They'll be there chasing you down like my dog chased me down up here a few weeks ago. But you know what? Greater is he who is within us than he who is within this world. Find those things to be thankful for because we don't have a long time, but a vapor that vanishes in the wind. That's it. If we get 80 or 90 years my best friend died at 53. I read about these people online that are you know, famous people. I don't know why we care about famous people any more than we care about the delete people in India. But for some reason, they make headlines. So-and-so, survivor contestant, died, dead at 47. This one, dead at 23. But this isn't a long time here on this earth, folks. We've got to make every day count as if it was our last day. So be thankful, be grateful. And that way you'll get up and you'll go, I'm gonna go do something for the Lord. I don't know what it is. If it's giving a cup of cold water to someone who needs it in Jesus' name, then that's what I'm going to do. We should start all our prayers with those words that Jesus started his with. Father, I thank you that you hear me. I have never started, I don't think I have ever started a prayer with, Father, I thank you that you hear me. Maybe, but it's not my go-to. But you know, after the Lord put this sermon in my heart, it's going to be. Because if God's not hearing us, and I don't think that he is, why do I bother praying? Just because it's what good people do, it's what Christian people who go to church do. I don't want to pray to something that can't help me. I don't want to pray to something that can't receive it. I don't want to pray to something or someone who doesn't know I exist. Like parents and children, you created that. And God created you. And he loves you more than any parent could ever love a child. He loves you more than your mom and dad ever did, no matter how much your mom and dad. My mom loves me to the moon and back. It doesn't compare with the love of Christ that he has for me. He died for me. He didn't even know me. I wasn't born for 2,000 years after the Bible says he went to that cross for me and for you and for you sitting at home. And if you haven't come to the point in your life that you realize that God loves you, that he is sitting in a place called heaven that can be your home, but you can't get there on your own because unfortunately, a guy named Adam and a gal named Eve disobeyed God thousands and thousands of years ago. And what happened was that brought sin into their life. And when they had children, that got imprinted into those children and into those children and into those children and into those children and into, children and into you and into me. And the only way to get rid of that sin and have it be uh, removed and have it be forgiven in your life is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through accepting him as your Lord and Savior, receiving the glorious wonder of what he's done for you, dying on that cross. For the Old Testament says that there is no forgiveness or remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And Doug said it quite a few times last week and this week. One of the last things he said, depending on what book you read was, It is finished. That's not what he told us, but it depends on what book you read. Because it was finished. There was nothing more that he was willing to do on that cross. He could have come down like they all asked him to. If you're really the son of God, get yourself down and take us with you and show us. He had shown them all he was gonna show them in those three and a half years. And if they didn't believe then, they weren't gonna believe if he came off that cross. But he died for you and he died for me. He said, Father, 
unto you I yield my spirit and he took his last breath and he died and that's where your life begins if that's something that God is pressing on your heart right now you want to come into the kingdom of heaven be a Christ follower a Christian simply pray these words after me dear heavenly father I thank you for your son Jesus I realize that I'm a sinner in need of a savior I know I can't get there on my own. And I thank you. And I love you. And I honor you for sending your son to die for me. So that when I die on earth, I will live with you in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen. Listen, the Bible tells us that when you receive Jesus Christ through that heart change and in that prayer, you got born again. Your spirit is now alive and the spirit of God has come inside of you. Tell somebody, text us here, get on the website, email us. Tell us, hey, I made a decision for Jesus today. We've got things that we want to send you. We've got things that we want to say to you. We want to have you come to a true knowledge and not lose that. Continue to be thankful. Continue to be grateful. Never give it up. And nothing and no one will ever swipe that salvation that you just got from you. In Jesus' name. How was that today? If it was good in the Spirit of God, come on, let's give him a, a hand clap of praise. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. In Jesus' name.